thanks for having me here. It's, uh, it's a real honor and a pleasure to talk in front of you today. Um, so what I'm going to talk about is innovation kind of broadly. And you know, when we think about innovation, what is innovation? You know, I think about it as really the engine that uh, changes our everyday lives for the better and really changes the way that we interact with the world and with each other. And when we think about innovation, you know, the first thing that comes to mind is the future and how do we predict the future and how can we you know, think about how innovation influences the way that our future is going to um, take shape. And so when we think about you know, 50 years, 100 years from now, you know, we often picture images like these, at least if you believe you know, the science fiction movies, um, you know, with wonderful flying ships and tall buildings and, and you know, the world in a very happy um, place. And you know, one thing that I think is interesting to think about is how good are we at predicting the future? Um, you know, how good are we in coming up with visions like these and, and comparing them to reality? And one way that we can evaluate that is kind of look into the past and see what we thought the world would look like today and see how close that is to reality. And so I found some interesting uh, material online. Uh, there is uh, a French artist uh, by the name of uh, Jean-Marc Coté that along with some of his contemporaries created uh, some artist rendering of what they thought the France in the year 2000 would look like. And so let's go through that and see how close they were to reality. So this was the first uh, innovation that they thought, uh, you know, they, they thought that the Postal Service was going to get better, which is good. Uh, and they thought that it was going to get better by postmen flying around and hand-delivering letters. Uh, you know, obviously they missed the whole digital revolution and the fact that most of our mail today takes the form of uh, emails and you know, the postal mail is you know, slowly dwindling its way down. Well, let's look at another one. So that one didn't, didn't succeed. Uh, you know, aviation was clearly uh, on top of mind in, in the 1900s. Uh, and so they thought everybody would be flying around on you know, personal airplanes and you have policemen that are you know, interesting contraptions with flying wings uh, you know, to stop people in mid-flight and issue them citations. So flying was a big thing, but you know, this was obviously another, another miss. I like this one, and I think you'll find it very relevant because this is the way you all should be learning now, according to you know, the thought of the, the 1900s. You know, the professor's job is to feed books into some kind of machine, uh, and that machine translates it through wires and you know, things that go into your brain, whether it's you know, waves or sound, who knows. But you still need to crank the machine, which is kind of interesting. They didn't think that we'd innovate our way out of cranking. <laughs> so, you know, so this is you know, obviously not what it is today, although you can see signs of, of that um, in the world today, especially if you look at the massive online or massive open online um, courses and, and, and the way that that's changing education, where a professor can now record his video lectures and you know, transmit it electronically to thousands of viewers across the world. And so this, you know, maybe they got this kind of close. And if you think about, you know, maybe a little bit further into the future, we might have virtual classrooms that software helps students learn in a self-paced way. Um, so you know, maybe we'll call this a maybe. Let's see what else they came up with. So this was, you know, this was kind of interesting. I don't know who came up with this or why, but recreationally we thought we changed from from fishing fish to fishing seagulls, and uh, I don't know how those seagulls would get caught after they landed in the water. But you know, clearly this innovation around being able to breathe in the water, they thought would be, um, you know, we have mass penetration and everybody would be using them, and we kind of move our lives from land to water, um, and that's you know reinforced by this. Uh, kind of recreational activity that we thought we'd be watching sea races underwater, and we kind of spend a lot of our lives uh, under under the water. And you know, obviously, this is a technology that never really took off. Uh, you know, it's it's still being used today for recreational activities, but not for um, you know for what they thought. And this looks like it didn't appear, but what this is supposed to be, um, if it if it did appear, is a picture of a robot that's uh, cleaning a house and you know uh, a maid standing with some wires attached to, to the robot while it you know, gently cleans the, the entire house. And this one, you know, except for the form factor, which you can't see, is a massive robot. Uh, except for the form factor, you know, they kind of got this right. We, you know, we have Roomba today, and, you know, that can run around and, and you know, wash, wash the floors and, and sweep it. But, you know, if you look at the grand, you know, the overall, the overall uh, message here is that we're terrible, right? They're predicting the future. And if you look at, you know, any point in history and, and you know, ask people what's the world going to be like, you know, 50 years from now, we don't really, we can't conceive how innovation and, and how technology is going to change our lives when you start getting several steps removed. You know, we can see it you know, five years or ten years out, but then in the distance it's, it gets much harder. And Steve Jobs, I think, captured the thought um, really well in the 2005 commencement speech that he gave at Stanford, where he said, you can't connect the dots by looking forward. You can only connect them by looking backward. 
So you have to trust that the dots will somehow connect in your future. And I think this is a great way of thinking about innovation and thinking about how we approach innovation, where it's not necessarily the destination that you need to predict, but the path that you take in order to get there. And understand all the different dots that line uh, the technology world today, and think about what are different ways that you can connect them. And go through the process of discovery in order to find new and innovative ways of applying that. And so Thomas Edison was you know, widely regarded as you know, one of the more prolific inventors of, um, of his, in history. You know, he, had, he held over a thousand patents in his name. He invented the light bulb. And, you know, he's responsible for the way we distribute electricity today in the homes. And you know, he has this great quote that says, I have not failed. I just found 10,000 ways that won't work. And I think this really captures the essence of how we go about innovation. Uh, and that is that we need to embrace failure. Because failure is a required component. It's, it's an integral path of getting to success. Um, and I think it's a little bit of a shame because, especially where you, know, kind of you guys are sitting from, because you get judged every day based on success rather than being encouraged to you know, learn and fail. You know, we all, as parents and as adults, judge you and as a college admissions board on you know, your ability to score high on standardized tests and to get A's and you know, by all means just a measure of success. And we don't encourage um, learning how to embrace failure and how to fail. And I think that's one of the things that actually makes you know, Silicon Valley extremely successful and, and, and one of the hubs of entrepreneurship and innovation in the world. Because here, as an entrepreneur, you can start a company and you can fail, and that will be a badge of honor that you can wear to the next opportunity and to the next company that you create, and you can then start calling yourself a serial entrepreneur because you've done it several times. Um, whereas in other parts of the world, if you fail in a venture that's viewed as, as a personal failure on yourself and, and, and one that is much more difficult to recover from. And so failure is one of those things that you need to embrace and then you need to learn how to use to your advantage. And one of the ways you can use it to your advantage is by looking at failure as a way of learning. Any path towards innovation um, is a process of discovery. And if you think about it as a process of discovery, then you need to come up with hypotheses that you test and many of the hypotheses that you test along the way are going to be failures by necessity in order for you to get to the success. And so, you know, Arthur, uh, William Arthur Ward has a great quote about it. Curiosity is the wick and the candle of learning. Because if you're curious about the world around you, then you'll view learning as a beneficial uh, side effect of progress and of failure and of getting to the eventual success. And this is something that, you know, I've personally embraced um, you know, very wholeheartedly in the way that I kind of looked at my career and the way that I looked at you know, opportunities that were presented before me. Um, and so I want to take you on a journey of you know, how I went through that learning process and, and how that's in, uh, impacted and influenced the way of uh, you know, how I got here today. And so this is where it started. Um, I don't know, probably nobody here recognizes this, maybe one or two in the audience, but this was the state of the art in gaming technology. Uh, back when I was a kid, when I was eight years old, I got this as a present. It was a Pac-Man game, kind of a miniature. It was about, you know, yay big. And uh, you know, had a little joystick on it. You, you watch these uh, little pixels move as, as you move the Pac-Man across the board. Um, and I loved, you know, I spent hours with this thing. And you know, it gave me endless, endless enjoyment. And one day, it broke. You know, it stopped working. And, uh, you know, I was devastated. This was my favorite toy. And uh, I decided, what the hell, you know, let's try to fix it. You know, what's the worst that can happen? And I'll just throw it away. So, you know, I unscrewed it back and, you know, took it apart. Looked inside, saw all these wires going everywhere, you know, circuits. And, you know, I was eight years old. I had no clue how any of these things work. But I figured, I'll give it a try. What's the worst that can happen? And, you know, I started moving things around. And, you know, I see one of the wires is disconnected. And so I try to move it different places. And all of a sudden, the lights go on. I'm like, hey, cool. And you know, I tape it there and, and I put it back up and it starts working. And you know, I'm thrilled and you know, I got my game back. And so from that point, I knew I wanted to be an engineer. Uh, because I wanted to, you know, I love tinkering with things and I love, you know, just the fact of being able to make something work again that, that was broken was just so gratifying. And then a few years later, I got, you know, this wonderful device that probably most of you don't recognize. Anybody know what this is? This is, uh, again, state of the art for its time. It was a computer that, that was called the Commodore 64. Um, 64 because it had a whopping 64 kilobytes of memory. Kilobytes. <laughs> Imagine that. I mean, you, a typical Word document that you create on your, your computers today is going to be bigger than 64 kilobytes. And this is the entire memory that the computer had. And so, you know, I learned how to um, how to write BASIC and 
and, uh, and, and learn uh, a little bit of programming on this thing. And I loved it, you know, and I knew I wanted to be a, a software engineer when I grew up. And so, you know, then when I was 14, I, uh, you know, I got my first real computer. It was an 8088 that had 256 kilobytes in it, four times as big. It was incredible. Um, and, you know, I wrote my first game there. I was really into Dungeons and Dragons, which was, you know, the first role playing game of its time. Um, and, you know, I wrote this game and, and just loved it, and then went on to college, uh, studied computer science, became a software engineer, and just learned a tremendous amount. From, from the people around me, you know, I worked with people who had 10 years more experience than I did, and just being in that environment, just I felt like I was learning so much. And, you know, I did that for, for three or four years. And then, you know, I started getting a little bit bored because I felt like I wasn't really learning much anymore, so I kind of started thinking about what else, what else should I be doing, and, you know, around that time, my manager came to me and he said, hey, you know, you've been doing a good job, you've been leading projects, how do you want to, how would you feel about managing a group? I'm like, okay, that's not what I wanted to do originally, but it sounds interesting, tons of learning. And so I did that. You know, I started managing teams and you know, learned all about leadership and motivation and you know, what it takes in order to deliver successful projects and you know, how most of the time really what you need to do is just get out of people's way to let them be successful in what they, in what they do. Um, and you know, I really enjoyed it and I grew and got promoted and, and, and had a lot of great success in that role. But then you know, a few years later, I kind of got bored again because I felt Okay, I learned everything there is to learn about, about being a good manager. You know, I was you know, a little arrogant at the time. Um, and so I thought about, you know, what else can I do? And, you know, I didn't really have any, any other uh, opportunities in front of me, so, you know, I did what anybody did at the time when they wanted to learn, and I went back to school. And so I went back and, and got my MBA because I was really interested in business. And, you know, mind you, this was at a time when, you know, I was 31 years old, uh, you know, two kids, the job, and so this is something I decided to do on the side. Um, wasn't something that was easy, but the fact that I was learning every day and exposed to this like, rich environment of ideas, um, I just I felt like I, I thrived in that environment. And I learned you know, some tremendous things you know, about marketing and finance and, and you know, how to run a business and, and venture, which would you know, eventually uh, come back into, into my life. Um, and I went off and you know, started, uh, excuse me, uh, joined uh, a startup because that's where all innovation happened, and I wanted to be in the center of it, and learned about you know, how do you go about creating companies and um, you know, building product and so on. And, uh, and then I went on to the next challenge, which was, uh, you know, if you've ever you know, been in a situation where you get a steady paycheck, and you have a mortgage to pay, and bills to pay, um, and then all of a sudden you decide to start your own company, it feels very much like sitting in a plane that you're about to jump off. Um, and I did that, and I started my own company. I ran a technology company um, for, for about 12 months with a close friend of mine. You know, learned a tremendous, a tre tremendous amount from it, but at the end, we failed. We weren't able to you know, get it off the ground, we didn't get the revenue that we needed to, and so we had to close it down. So, you know, I look back at it, and it's a failure. It's something that I didn't succeed at. I wanted, you know, obviously I wanted this thing to be successful, and you know, I wanted never to work again and, and retire. Um, and we didn't succeed, but the amount of learning that took place in, in, you know, in that year was just incredible. And I think it's given me a perspective to do what I do today with a very different lens about you know, how do you go about building a company, how do you go about building a product, uh, and getting customers. And it would be very hard to have done that without going through that experience. And so you know, from there, I went to another startup. Um, I went to a solar company, uh, you know, tried to reduce our carbon footprint and you know, put solar on the roof, and you know, that was a lot of fun. And then I got an incredible opportunity to um, go work for Netflix. And you know, this was in a time when Netflix was, um, you know, it was a well-known brand primarily for, for shipping DVDs by mail, and it was just starting to come up with its streaming service. And what attracted me towards this was, again, the opportunity to learn something that I had never done before. Um, how do you come up with software? How do you come up with technology that you know, delivers a third of all the traffic that comes to you know, everybody's homes? It's just, you know, it's mind-blowing. Um, and so I did that and you know, learned a tremendous amount. And the other thing that I learned from Netflix is the kind of culture that you want to create in order to um, really get um, people working at their peak. Um, you know, Netflix is really well known for its, the, the high-performance culture that um, that they have, and you know, from everywhere that I've had the pleasure of work, Netflix has really been the most phenomenal place. And, you know, everything was going great. I was having a good time, um, but then you know, I changed course again, and uh, and this time I got the opportunity to join a venture capital 
uh, firm in order to sit on the other side of the table and invest into startups. And you know, this is something that I had always kind of thought about doing sometime in the future, but uh, you know, opportunity presented itself, and it was just incredible learning opportunity. And you know, I've been doing this since since last year, and, and I can't tell you, you know, how much learning has taken place in that time. And so, if you go back and think about you know the dots and how these dots connect, you know, I can stand in front of you today and I can tell you this you know nice story about how you know one thing led to another, and it looks like it makes perfect sense. It was either you know I can even pretend like I planned it this way. Um, but if you ask me at any point along the way what I was going to be like in five years and what my life would be like you know, five, ten years later, you know, it's very unlikely that, that I would have been able to predict that. Um, but you know, it's kind of taking the path of learning along the way is really what led me to where I am today. And, and, and I think that's really one of the core tenets of innovation and of entrepreneurship. And so what I want to do um, is take you through a couple of um, these kind of big dots that I've seen in, in, you know, in my days through technology. Um, you know, some big trends out there that I think will help you think about innovation and help you think about how to create these different connections as you think about um, what other uh, innovation can come from, can, can, can bring to bear. So anybody know what this is? It's, um, it's actually the most powerful computer on the planet. Um, Taken out of, you know, looks like it was taken out of a Star Trek uh, movie. But this is the most powerful computer on the planet. If we were in 1985, uh, this is the Cray 2 supercomputer. Um, it occupied a whole room. And if you look at the dimensions of, of, of this thing, it, you know, 16 square feet, square feet of space, you know, 45 inches high, weighed 5,500 pounds. It's you know, two Honda Civics in a room. Um, it, uh, you know, it required 200 kilowatts of power to run, which is, you know, a typical computer, a desktop computer takes about 200 watts of power, so about a thousand times more power than, than your typical computer. You needed a generator to run this thing, and, you know, it was liquid cooled because otherwise it would just overheat. And, you know, this was the state, uh, the state of technology, the, the peak. It was able to achieve um, this metric, 1.9 gigaflops. Um, you know, a flop is a floating point uh, operation per second. It's a measure of computational, uh, computational strength, computational uh, capacity. And this was you know, the best that the world could do. And then you know, fast forward a little bit to today, and we have you know, things that we keep in our pockets, right? You know, these, these iPhones, and you know, this is an iPhone 5 that uh, was released in 2013, you know, just, just a little under 30 years after the Cray 2. It can do 76.8 gigaflops, right? So you know, 40 times more powerful than, than the most powerful supercomputer is you know, something that we can hold in our hands today. And this in cost you know, $500. The Cray 2 was about $5 million uh, in 1985. So you know, Moore's Law just continues to prove itself. Um, you know, transistor density doubling every 18 months. And this is creating just incredible opportunities um, in the world where, where you can now have um, microprocessors embedded in you know, almost anything you can think about. Um, and, and you know, there's, there's an incredible amount of opportunity and an incredible amount of innovation and technology that gets created as a result. You know, the first one, uh, you know, an obvious one is, is you know, these devices where we now have mobility. You know, half of all um, online browsing comes from, from mobile devices. And so we consume most of the information that we have today, or at least half of it, um, from, from mobile devices. And it's creating just an entirely new way of interacting with the world. You, know, you can take a picture of something you like and send it to your friend and then get it a couple of seconds later. Um, companies are using this in order to just revolutionize and completely change the way that they do business. Um, insurance companies are having their customers take pictures of damage to their car and um, doing the claims remotely instead of sending adjusters to, um, to people's homes and you know, saving thousands and thousands of dollars. Uh, and so mobility is, is one incredible trend that um, just is going to continue changing the way that we live today. And then if we extend that one step further, and we think about mobility and, um, and connectivity, you know, everywhere you go now, you have a device that's, that's connected to the internet somewhere, whether it's through your phone or through your Wi-Fi at home. Take this pervasive computing capability that's at a very low cost and marry it with um, connected computing, and you get you know, an incredible amount of devices that you know, is often labeled Internet of Things. Um, you know, I like to refer to it as connected sensors. That create technology that just lives everywhere. Uh, you know, I have a nest at home, and I can control the temperature of my house from work or when I go on vacation. 
um, I have a Wi-Fi connected scale that I get on every morning and it takes my my, my weight and, and my um, body fat and then uploads it to a server and I can you know, bring it up on my phone and I can see how my weight's changed over time. And it's incredible to think about how the world is going to interact with us through these connected devices that are always on and always sensing the things around them. And you can imagine not too far in, in the future walking into your home and your lights automatically you know, turning on because it senses the proximity. Uh, that you've created uh, in, through a geofenced way, and you know, the temperature gets adjusted to the right level, and your tea uh, you know, gets put on because you, know, you like to drink tea when you come home. So you know th this is an area that's just ripe for innovation, and is going to continue uh, changing the way we interact with the world. And at the core of all of that is software. Right? So if you think about um, software and the way that it's changing our environment and our world, and it's incredible how pervasive that is in everything that we do. Um, this is, you know, there was a great article that Mark Andreessen wrote um, a few years ago in the Wall Street Journal called Why Software is Eating the World that, you know, I encourage you all to read if you haven't. But basically, it's, you know, everything that's, you know, everything that's digital um, is now moving into the physical world. Software used to be something that was, you know, restricted to online companies, you know, things like Amazon becoming the largest uh, e-commerce store. Now software is in everything that we interact with, whether it's going to be through connected devices or, um, through control systems that we have in, in, in various parts of our lives. And you know, I, that's, why, that's why I think uh, organizations like Code for America are so important for us because understanding software really becomes uh, a necessity for understanding the world around us. And just like we teach physics and biology and chemistry in, uh, in our schools, you know, software needs to be one of those core sciences that we start adding to the curriculum. And the last thing is data. And so, <coughs> The, the, the statistics about the rate at which we're creating data is, is just staggering. 90% um, of the world's data has been created in the last two years. And just, just think about that for a second. In the last two years, we've created nine times as much data as in you know, the entire history of human civilization. Um, the fact that, I mean, that's just created an incredible opportunity for us to be able to um, do intelligent things with that data and, and create new technology in order to um, process that data. And so, you know, there's a lot of great examples of this. Netflix, I, you know, is my favorite one because I've spent some time there. But, you know, Netflix knows what everybody watches and knows what you, know, you watch. And based on that, it can recommend movies for you that are going to be more likely ones that you'll enjoy. And it also uses all of that data in order to influence what content they invest into um, to make it more likely that you'll enjoy future content. Um, you know, the government is, is also helping with, um, with data. They have the Open Data Initiative that, um, you know, if you haven't heard about, I encourage you to go to data.gov. They're making you know, a whole bunch of public data sources available so that you can create applications and um, you can create interesting uses of that data. They just released um, a new climate uh, subsection where they're making you know, a ton of climate data available online and you know, hoping that it will help us address the global climate change. And so, you know, the way that um, data is just fundamentally shifting the way that we work and the way that we live, I think, is, is um, a really interesting trend that's only going to continue and only going to create more opportunity for innovation. So I want to end with, um, with one thought that is a question that I get asked very often about, you know, what is it that makes successful entrepreneurs? And I thought about this, and, you know, I came up with two things. Um, and that's you know, perseverance and learning. As an entrepreneur, you're going to fail many, many more times and you'll succeed. Um, and if you'll treat those failures as you know, statements of your own quality, then you're very unlikely to be successful as an entrepreneur. But to the extent that you use that as opportunities for learning and you approach the world with curiosity and you look at it as a journey of discovery, that's going to make you much more successful as an entrepreneur. You know, pursue your passion and allow yourself to fail. Be curious about the world around you and always look for opportunities to learn. And go out there, create, and make the world a better place. Thank you. Uh, how can we develop and foster an innovative mindset amongst our youth and young adults? How do we foster innovation? Um, I mean, I think the thing that we don't do a great job of in, in our curriculum and our education system is um, 
focusing on learning and, and how to learning how to learn rather than learning information and learning um, knowledge. Uh, and, and if you think about you know, what are the drivers of innovation, it's really our ability to learn new things and our ability to process information and kind of come up and connect it in new and interesting ways. And you know, fostering that creativity is not something that the educational system we have you know, here today does a great job of. And so that's one thing that I think, you know, if we figure out how to, how, to, how to change our education system to focus more on the learning process and learning how to learn rather than just regurgitation of information, then we'll be much better off as innovators. You spoke a little bit about failing. Is there such a thing as failing too much or too often? I mean, yeah, there is. And, and I guess the only time you can really fail is when you stop. Because then you have nothing else to follow it that could be a success. And so I think as long as you keep looking for ways to succeed, then all of the failures you have along the way are just steps in order to get to your final goal. Uh, on wearable technology, what are your thoughts on where the future of tech is going? Um, the ability to, to just know much more about how um, our bodies work and how we interact with the world around us. I think, you know, if I know that when I you know, eat a burger, my blood sugar spikes and then you know, I start getting sleepy afterwards, you know, probably already know that. But um, you know, having the data to actually back that up, um, I, think, I think that lets us live in a much more data-driven way. You spoke about how um, you're very passionate about learning, and I was curious on what's your process in like, uh, I guess, how you uh, effectively learn new things. I, it's different for everybody. I don't think there's, there's a recipe that you can follow. You know, some people learn by you know, trying it out and then kind of walking, learning how to walk by falling. Other people learn by you know, reading massive amounts of information and, and, and then um, digesting it. You know, personally, for me, it tends to be by doing. You know, I learn best by trying to tinker with things and then seeing what works and what doesn't work. And you know, when something doesn't work, trying to go and get information and kind of evolving and iterating that way. But I think it's very different for everybody. Um, you, you talked about the importance of data in the future, and I was just wondering if you think software algorithms that process data and, and dictate what we see and interact with on the web, like Google search, Amazon, Facebook, whatever it is, do you, do you think that's ultimately going to help us in the future, or it's going to hurt us more? That's a great question. Um, yeah, that's a really good question. We, you know, one of the things I didn't mention is that the fact that there's so much data out there, you know, about you and about me and everyone else, has just you know incredible privacy implications. And you know, some of it is you can you can if you look one way, you can see a very scary world, right? About having no privacy anywhere that you go, and you know, companies knowing exactly what you like and targeted, you know, targeting you with advertising that is much more likely to make you buy things that you don't want to buy. Um, you know, so that's kind of the cynical view of the world. Um, I, I tend to take um, kind of a little bit more pragmatic approach where. I think um, will evolve in the way that we deal with privacy, and privacy is going to change um, from what it is today, which is very opaque. We don't know, you know, what data is collected about us and where, to something that becomes a currency that will trade for value. And so, when we go to a merchant, you know, sometimes we'll be willing to give up parts of our, uh, you know, privacy in order to get valuable service. Uh, on the other hand, um, where where things get a little bit um, concerning is in things like advertising where we get no value from it and, and you know, the other side that collects the data gets value. So I think you know, we're going to shift as we, as we learn more about how to make um, privacy more transparent um, for it to become a currency of value rather than just something that's collected about us. So I think it's going to be you know, better. It's a, it's a short answer to your question. Thank you so much, Mr. Tom. Thank you very much.